fastest we have today, but that was our last native horse and it died off about 10,000 years ago. So the horses that we have now actually came to us from Spain in the 1500s. Coronado brought them over to go and find the city of gold that he, or cities of gold that he was looking for in, in the new world. Well, he never found the cities of gold, but he did trade off a lot of horses to the Native Americans who then kept trading and trading and trading. And finally, they were all over the continent. So the, the point of that is, is that when we look at history, the horses that we have today did not evolve with the land. In most areas of the world where you have like giraffes, lions, other animals out on the native soil where they evolved, the land supports them very well. The problem with horses in North America is they didn't evolve here. So the land and the horses don't really mesh that well. So, but we can help that. We can really, we can do some of these best practices and help that meshing process. And actually the horses can do fair, do pretty good here. So, um, but the first thing that we have to address and the most daunting thing we have to address is the mud. What do we do about it? Well, as we all know, and uh, if you have horses and you've paid enough vet bills, <laughs> your veterinarian has probably told you and your farriers probably told you a lot of these things about why the mud is unhealthy for the animals. And you know, you lose shoes um, and shoes are expensive, right? A full set of shoes that, for my horse is like 140, 150 bucks. So that's a lot of money. You lose one shoe, you're still paying them 50 bucks to come put the shoe back on or something. So it saps the body heat. Okay, there's not many um, veins running in the leg. So it, it's hard for them to, to warm that up anyway. Uh, it wastes the feed, you know, if feed drops down there, it's slippery, puddles, de uh, in, uh, uh, they carry mosquitoes and things. So a uh, lot of reasons why mud is bad for horses. It's also bad for the soil. It mobilizes sediment. So you got a, a lot of erosion. Uh, it allows the manure nutrients to go into streams uh, because it's not caught there with good grass. And without grass cover, the mud allows the fecal bacteria in the water. So we have to control the mud, not just to help the horse, but also to help the soil. You have to help both. And it's serious business. I mean, I, I get um, calls a lot from people that say, you know, my, my vet was just out here. I'm paying another bill for a abscess. Uh, I don't understand what's going on. Can you come out? And sure enough, it's the paddocks are muddy, they're wet. You know, it's, there's a lot of things that are going on. You don't have any gutters on the, on the barn and the water is collecting there where they step out. So it, it can be pretty serious money. Um, you know, I, and that's what I try and explain to people is that when you're spending money with your farrier for lost shoes and you're paying for the vet to come out and look at an abscess, it's a whole lot cheaper to put the gutters up on there and route the water away. So. Um, so the solutions, again, like we're talking about is to create what's called a heavy use area, preferably during dry weather and with good footing and lighting. And we're gonna get into the details of all of these in a minute. Install gutters and downspouts, construct manure bins for storage and composting, remove the horses from pastures when they're saturated or the grass is too short and practice good pasture management. And so let's talk about the details of those. So the heavy use area is an area that you will um, decide not to grow any grass at all. It's going to be an area where your horse is typically at a lot. Like this horse likes to hang out in the corner here. So you can see they put some gravel and, and some cloth down so that he likes to be there. Maybe that's the path to the water tank, path to the gate. It's an area that gets a lot of use by the horse. So let's protect it because otherwise he's just going to chew it up and make it into a bunch of mud. And so what a heavy use area does is it protects that ground. Now you're not going to grow grass on it, but if you construct it properly, it's not going to create mud. So it'll protect the soil and the horse. Uh, to me, the, the heavy use area is the key to mud prevention. 
because really the mud and the destruction of the soil uh, on top of the grass comes because the horse is um, going onto the ground that is not strong enough to hold a thousand pound animal. And he's tearing it up, not maliciously, but just because he's walking through it. So by building a heavy use area where he does these things, where he walks through, goes to the water tank, goes to the gates, you can prevent the soil from being destroyed. Um, you wanna locate the heavy use area on a high and dry ground because one of the aspects that we'll I'll talk about in a second is that you want that heavy, uh, that heavy use area to be able to shed the water off that it collects and drain properly into it, a safe area. But you don't want it adjacent to a waterway, so don't put it next to the stream, okay? <laughs> and you don't want any drainage through it because you wanna keep it um, as together as possible. If you get a water um, uh, drainage going through a heavy use area, it compromises the structure of it and the gravel starts to wash away and then you lose it. So, and then you wanna direct the surface water around the area. If you've got a stream of water coming down that way, put a pipe down and route it around it. Again, we gotta protect, protect it from um, water flowing through it. Um, you of course want safe fencing around it, uh, easy access for delivery trucks, wide gates. So if you've got a heavy use area where you have your horse, what I always imagine is what happens if my horse goes down at the far end of it in the most inaccessible place. You want the farrier to be able to back up there. You want the, the vet truck to be able to back in. So don't put an eight foot gate. You're gonna need a 10 foot, 12 foot gate. So keep that in mind. And size minimum, this is really a debatable uh, subject because the size depends on uh, some factors like the age of the horse, the breed of the horse, the size of the horse. Um, so if you take all those into account, if you've got um, a mini or a Shetland, uh, you're not gonna need, but maybe 500, 700 square feet. But if you've got a hot blood, or warm blood from Europe, you might need 2,000 square feet. I mean, or an Arabian, you know, racehorse, you got a thoroughbred. Now, my old quarter horse, eh, you could get by on 1,000 feet, but it just depends on the horse. And that's where when you begin constructing a heavy use area, I always say construct what you are comfortable with and go as large as possible, but then put temporary fencing around it. Because if you get the horse in there and you find out over time that, oh, this isn't big enough for him, then you can easily take the fencing down, adjust it, put the fencing back up, or put permanent fencing up now that you know what the size is and go with that. So there's a lot of ways you can approach this and play with it a little bit. And good outdoor lighting. I can't emphasize that enough, especially this time of year. After December 21st, when we've got like our days seem like they're like half an hour long. Everything is dark. <laughs> you need good lighting. Now, the other thing about good lighting is uh, it's not just because of the time of year, but we are cloudy here a lot. So it's hard to see sometimes. And especially when your vet and your fairy come over to work on the horse in the barn or in the stall, you want some good lighting in there for them too. Uh, my fairy carries around a bunch of big LED lights he pulls out. So, um, but you don't want them to have to do that or, you know, you want them to be able to see, especially the veterinarian, uh, if they're looking for a cut or looking at an abscess or something like that. Now, <clears throat> on the heavy use area, again, the heavy use area, if I could say it basically, is cloth or what we call road cloth. Uh, it's like a, it's a geotextile woven fabric that you put down, and then you put six inches of gravel on top of that. So let's talk about the gravel part or the footing, okay? Um, the best and the most recommended I, I do is the 5 eighths minus gravel. Um, the reason I like the 5 eighths, and some of you may have heard about 5 eighths minus from your farrier, maybe even your veterinarian, and they say they don't like it because it's too big or it's pokey or whatever. That's fine. I've got just as many veterinarians and farriers that'll say it's great stuff. Okay, so it's, again, if, you're, if you have horses and have been in the horse world a while, we could debate all day long on a bunch of stuff, as you know. Um, I like cow horses. You might be a dressage rider. 
we're not going to see the same thing. But the fact is, is that the five eighths minus um, is the base, I, I think. So if you put down the cloth and put the five eighths minus there and use that as your base, you can put three eighths minus on top. You can put sand, you can put whatever you want on top as long as it's able to drain down into the five eighths. Now sand's gonna be a tough one. It's cause it's gonna plug it up a little bit. But the reason I recommend five eighths is because if you look at the size of the stone, if you, you'll notice that it's unique in size and shape and the length of it, the five eighths is unique because it will interlock with itself much, much better than three eighths, one inch, any of the other sizes. It's kind of interesting how it does that. And so that's important because you want the stone to interlock because what that does is it creates a nice firm foundation. It's firm enough to hold the weight of the horse and it allows the water to go through it. And then, so that's, that's really important. Um, I know a lot of places that five eight, six inches to five eights compacted, it'll last almost eight to 10 years before you have to redo it. And you only have to redo it because the horse's poop on it, you're picking it, that organic material will get in there and over time it'll break down that bond. And of course, just the motion of the horse. So, but eight to 10 years, that's pretty darn good um, when compared to a lot, a lot of other things. So um, the other thing is that uh, if you've got an area where it's just a mud pit right now and you don't have the money to spend on the five eights because it can be expensive depending on where you get it from. Um, people use hog, hog fuel. Uh, it's just basically wood chips or um, it used to be called by their proper term hog fuel. It's literally uh, wood or wood bark that's been stripped and ripped. And so it's long fingers of wood and stuff. It's great stuff for putting down. Um, in a temporary situation. And I'd put it down in a paddock, I'd put it anywhere. Uh, if you've got a bunch of mud, put down the hog fuel. Cause what you're gonna do is you're gonna protect the soil and you're also gonna protect your horse's hoofs. Okay, they'll be out of the wet and to protect the soil. Now the disadvantage to hog fuel is it's gonna break down and it's gonna break down within a year and you're gonna have to scrape it out and replace it. Uh, and I, I know people that use it as their primary footing. Uh, they'll put it down, it'll break down and then you, they'll have to replace it. They replace it about every year, okay? It's not as expensive as gravel, but it will add up over a couple of years to be as expensive as gravel. And it, you know, if gravel is gonna last you eight to 10 years versus hog fuel that you're gonna spend probably about the same amount in two to three years, you know, it's, it's one of those math games you need to play. But um, I, I wouldn't consider it as a permanent solution because again it, it will break down and it also over time as the oils in that wood seep out especially if you're using like hog cedar or something like that um, the wood is an organic material and it will uh, hold bacteria and some other things so that's why you want to rip it out after about a year and get new new stuff put down um, the other one is sand with geotextile fabric underneath. Uh, sand is a great uh, footing. I used a lot of sand when I was in Kansas and Texas because where I was at was the heart of the old Dust Bowl. We had plenty of sand, uh, so it was cheap. Uh, but also we only got six inches of rain a year. So it never, it was always sand. <laughs> and uh, so when we did get moisture, it was like snow, like we're gonna be getting tonight. But, um, so sand is good for um, older horses, for horses that have been laminitic, uh, horses that have hoof issues. Uh, the older ones really, like I say, it's good for the old ones, especially if you want to put it in a, in a piece of the paddock that they can go lay down in. Uh, they love that, especially on a sunny day. When that sand gets warm, it's good for their bones and muscles. They'll just lay down and love it. Uh, the only drawback is is that sand will act like mud when it's wet around here. So if you have an area where you can cover it, put a roof over it, a little tin roof or something, uh, put some sand down so the horse can lay down, that'd be great. Uh, but otherwise realize that if you've got sand out in the open, it's gonna act like mud. So just keep that in mind. 
Um, and the thing about all of these footings, you can actually do a combination. So you don't have to go all gravel. You don't have to go all hog fuel. You can actually go hog fuel in one area, gravel in one. If you've only got money for half the paddock for gravel, put it down, do the rest with hog fuel, and then add the rest of the gravel as you get it. Uh, same with sand. You can have gravel up to a certain point, and then the last quarter of the paddock be sand. So the old guy can walk out there and lay down, but when it's raining and get, it gets kind of muddy looking, he can stay off of it, or you can put a temporary fence up and keep him off. So you've got a lot of options you can play with there. Now here's a picture of uh, heavy use area going in. You can see that the uh, grass in this area has been removed and uh, we're putting down some road cloth and the gravel uh, on top of that. Now the uh, geotextile that we're using is called, like I say, road cloth. Um, I got mine from ACF West in Woodenville. So that's probably for you guys living in Bothell, it's probably as close to, as you can get. Um, really good folks. Uh, they've been selling that stuff for years. We, we use it at the district for a lot of projects. So um, we're not really advertising any one company, but if you do a Google search and look for geotextile fabric, they're going to be the first ones come up. Really good folks. Um, and they actually provide this geotextile cloth for a lot of the uh, uh, road construction companies around here. So that's really what it is. And what you're building is basically a, a road bed for the horse, because um, the horse is as big as some cars. Um, so you need that cloth to be able to take the weight and the weight of the gravel. And so that's why we recommend that. And it's not that expensive, really. Um, I can't remember because I, did, <laughs> I didn't pick it up, but um, I was told that I, I'd measured out, I redid our paddocks this summer here, and I measured it out, and they told me that for the amount I needed, might as well buy the whole roll and it was cheaper that way. So when you go down, when you figure it out and call them up and, and ask them about the price or if you, even if you get it up at Skagit, um, be sure and ask, well, what's a whole roll cost? Because <laughs> you can always get a whole roll and maybe share it with a friend. You know, If you're in 4-H or somewhere or some other horse club, uh, Hollywood Hills or whatever, call them up and say, hey, I got some roll cloth and share it with the friends. I mean, it's always fun. Uh, Skagit Farmer Supply, if you're up north, um, is another one that sells it as well. Um, again, you see the pile of gravel back there and the cloth going down. Um, that's a heavy use area just off the uh, a stall. Uh, here's another. Here's a picture, a uh, good picture of the combination I was talking about. So you've got gravel here next to the entrance into the stall and the hitching post there, and you've got uh, a gate where he's going out to his pasture. So you got that down there, but the other area the horse likes to walk, he doesn't walk very often, so he's just gonna put down some hog fuel and that's gonna protect that soil uh, that's there and uh, give him an area to go if he wants to go. But most of the time, that heavy use area where the gravel is is where you wanna protect. Uh, there's another picture of the hog fuel, same place really. Um, gravel there. Um, and then hog fuel in the background. Another picture of hog fuel on a slope. Hoof grid, you may have heard of. Uh, it's great stuff if you're Bill Gates. No, <laughs> it is expensive. Uh, if you can afford it, it's great, great stuff. And it will last decades. Um, I highly recommend it if you can get it. And not just hoof grid, but any of the, the mud control uh, grid uh, technologies like that. There's a, one called Light Hoof. Um, I was doing a Google search just last week, and there are many, many companies selling very similar uh, type designs now. It's not just hoof grid and light hoof. It's, I wish I could remember the other one I was looking at, but it's like a, a light hoof type, but it's got holes within the cells. Because one thing that the thing about hoof grid and, and light hoof, they, they don't, they're, they're great about keeping the gravel in place, but they still got a ways to go when it comes to letting water flow between the cells. And there are some out there that can do that. So, um, and the price is coming down on, especially on some of the newer technologies. So 
If you're thinking about going along this line, I highly encourage it, but just do your research and find out um, what your options are because there's a whole lot more options out there today than there, than there were just a few years ago. Uh, here is an engineering drawing um, that shows the basic heavy use area. And so I just wanna walk you through a few important points. The first one being that one to 2% slope. That is important because really on a heavy use area, what's happening is you're putting the gravel down so that the horse can step on it and not hit the soil, but also you're lifting him off and the way that 5 eighths minus is uh, connected together, it's gonna allow the rain as it falls to go through the, the gravel and hit the um, road cloth. And that one to 2% slope will allow that water to shed off and not stay in one place. Because if it were totally level, then the water would just collect and you'd have a lake after a little bit. So at one to 2% slope is very important. And I know that sounds like, huh, maybe that sounds like a lot, but it's not. So we're talking like an inch every 10 feet, you know, it's, it's not that much. Um, and um, the other important thing is the six inches of gravel. It's, and, and the fact you have to dig down. Uh, you can't just put gravel on top of the cloth and because the horse will just move it away. So you wanna dig down to allow uh, that kind of a barrier so that the gravel will stay in place. And make sure that that water and that slope is towards something safe for it to go. Uh, and that means like a, a grass filter strip of some kind. Um, don't point it right directly at the creek <laughs> because you want that water to be filtered through a good amount of grass grassed area, maybe into um, a native planted area or something. Now you're gonna have some good nutrients in that water. If we get a big uh, rainstorm come through and you get a lot of water hitting heavy use area, it's gonna, it's gonna filter out and wash away a lot of that urine that's gonna be there from the horse and um, manure uh, that's gonna be in there. So those are good nutrients. And when they're, when they're um, uh, mixed with water, like the rainwater, uh, it's, it's good, but it's still in a concentrated um, form that we don't want going into the creeks or streams or anything around it. We want it to go into a safe place a good, good bit of a uh, grassed area. So keep that in mind. That's a very important piece. Um, here's an example of an area that's a good candidate for a heavy use area. You've got your water tank. Um, you've got a gate over there to the left and this, the uh, stall looks like a noble shelter. Um, so good, good place to put some gravel down. Bedding. Uh, I'm going to want to talk about bedding a little bit, just briefly, because bedding will uh, kind of wraps into the conversation we're going to have in a minute about composting. Um, bedding um, is its primary purpose is to absorb urine, so you want something that's really uh, does a good job of absorbing urine. Um, the thing you want to do is minimize the amount of bedding, and I know that for some, especially with older horses, uh, we don't want them to get hawk sores. We want them to be able to rest well, but um, we also don't want to use too much bedding because that bedding will go into our compost pile and it actually slows down the compost process. Bedding is considered a brown. So um, if you're talking about composting, you're talking about green versus brown. You want a green and brown ratio that's really healthy, more green than brown, because green provides all the enzymes and the microbes and things that to break down the composting process, the brown doesn't do much. And why is that? There's no living things in there really. There's no microbes, it's not green. It doesn't, it doesn't do uh, much. Uh, it'll break down eventually, but it's being broken down by the green. So we want a good ratio there. So want to minimize bedding as much as possible so that your compost process is as quickly quick as possible. Although if you have to put some in there, it's not gonna hurt it as long as you don't get too much. Um, 
And the ratio that we're looking at that I like is like a 90 to 10. Uh, you can go 80, 20. I wouldn't go any further than that. Um, I've known, I've known some people that are doing like a 50, 50, they run a equestrian boarding facility and they think they've got to put in a whole lot of bedding because, well, you know, that you got to please the customers, but you do pay a price for that. So, uh, lighting again, uh, after December 20 or around December 21st, it gets dark. You want some good lighting around your barn and use headlamps and things like that because, you know, they're, <laughs> If, if your horse is like mine, if it's going to break something or do something dumb, it's going to do it in the middle of winter, right when you can't see it, and in the middle of a rainstorm. But I digress. <laughs> Did I mention I have a gilding? Anyway, um, so roof water management, wanted to talk quickly about that. Um, this is why gutters are very important. Gutters and downspouts and underground outlets, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, because uh, it's amazing when you look at even the smallest structure that we have, like a 30 by 50 barn or even your little tool shed, um, how much water it can collect. So in Snohomish County, I figured that a 30 by 50 barn is probably about average. And then we get 32 inches of rain a year. Well, there's a formula down here at the bottom of the slide. And I got that from uh, Texas A&M and from their rain harvesting uh, page and when you put all, all the numbers for that it comes out to almost 30,000 gallons a year for that little barn 30,000 gallons and so you can go around and measure all your barns and measure your sheds and your house and everything else plug it into that formula and figure out how many thousands of gallons you're getting the average property is probably pulling down close to 50,000 to 75,000 gallons a year coming off the roof. Well, you can capture some of that and use it, uh, but really what we need to do uh, is funnel that away in a safe manner, um, away from the heavy use area, into that grass um, and into the soil so the soil can do its job, which it's really good at doing around here because the rain and the soil here evolve together, right? So um, we need to make sure they do it safely. And how, how do we do that? Gutters, downspouts, and underground outlets. Um, very important, especially on a large facility like this one. Uh, so as you can see the new gutters on there, uh, the downspouts are great. Um, but the important thing, especially around here, is it's, let me go back here. So you can see the big barn there um, with the gutters on it. So imagine it didn't have any gutters. And that 29,000 gallons is shedding off the roof and falling straight down. Now, the soil here and every soil across the nation has evolved so that when rain falls, it can take that raindrop and absorb it. And it can take that raindrop and absorb it. And it can take a whole bunch of raindrops and absorb it. What it can't do very well is take water that's coming off on a sheet and hitting it in one small spot and absorb that very well. Because what happens is the soil becomes really saturated all of the sudden and all kinds of weird dynamics start going on inside the soil. And then you've got mud issues, you've got foundations that are compromised. So, and I'm sure that some of you have been around a barn where you don't have any gutters and you look down, there's a line and that line is created by the water compacting, it's actually compacting the soil there at that point. So it's not a good thing. So that's why gutters are important, downspouts, um, but especially important around here because the amount of rain we get is the underground outlet. So it's good to have the downspouts come down and collect all that water off the roof so it doesn't come out. But what if you have a downspout and it's just coming out beside the, the house or the, beside the barn, it's going to put water out there right next to it. So that's not always a good thing because, and depending on the soil type, it could be worse, but because it'll put all that water out to be absorbed by the grass and that may saturate it and go back towards the foundation. So we wanna get that water away to a safer area and like this one here. And so you can see the barn in the top right, 
uh, the pipe is coming from there and it's coming out to this place here where they've, they've kind of armored it a little bit. So the water coming out doesn't damage the soil around it. And then it'll go down to an area off to the left uh, where it can be absorbed safely. Um, so very important there. Um, another very important, especially if you have geldings, um, is to protect those downspouts. Now this here, uh, this person decided to protect them with some hot wire, uh, which is fine. Um, I had to put uh, bigger PVC pipe around mine up in Kansas and, uh, and all my places because the horses, especially in the summertime, they get itchy. They like to rub on that stuff and they'll take out those, those uh, downspouts and heartbeat. So if you've got them in an area where the horses could access them, be sure and protect them because you don't wanna have to replace them all the time. And now we talk about manure. So manure is basically filled full of excess nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, usually in horse manure, and bacteria, fecal coliform. Now those things help in the compost process, but if we don't control them, control where they're at and keep them away from sensitive areas, they can be a problem. Uh, they also contain parasites, mosquitoes, and fly larvae. Uh, that doesn't smell very good. Unless you're like me, I've been around horse manure enough. I don't even smell it anymore. Um, it's unsightly and creates mud if you leave it in one place. So we want to take care of it. So again, to manage the manure, uh, create the heavy use area and make sure you pick it. Um, and pick it daily or at least every, well, I, I used to say every three days, but around here, especially with the rain, every, at least every two days. Um, I pick mine daily. In fact, we, we pick in the morning and I pick in the evening when I get home. So, and then, you know, so it's about twice a day, but it really helps to preserve that heavy use area and the drainage in it. Um, and then you wanna place the manure storage near the sacrifice area for chore efficiency. You don't wanna be having to pick all that stuff and then, haul that wheelbarrow all the way up the hill to the manure bin. Okay, so think about an area where you can keep it close. Uh, here's a good picture. Um, a friend of mine in Mukilteo, uh, their uh, manure bin, you can see the tarp on top there. The tarp is also very important for keeping the rain off. Um, you don't want all those nutrients to wash away. There's the worst case scenario we're trying to avoid. That is literally all manure. And this poor lady here, she didn't know what to do with it. We came in, helped her. It looks great now, but it's a great example of, you know, I see this a lot. People call me out. I don't know what to do. The thing is falling down. I heard you could help. Yeah. So we go in and try and help. Um, and it doesn't have to be expensive. These are old pallets. You just want something to contain it and then keep a tarp on it. The tarp is the important thing because the rain will not only wash away the nutrients, but it will break it down to the point where it's unusable and it keeps it cold so the compost process can't happen. So you just want something to contain it and keep a tarp on it. Okay. Now here's the Cadillac model. <laughs> you got gravel base, you got the bins, and you got the concrete strip down there. Um, that's so the bucket of the tractor doesn't. Uh, um, scoop up the gravel, so. Compost benefits. I mean, if you were to go down to Bailey's uh, in Snohomish and pick up some compost, they'd charge you a lot. So if you make it yourself, you can save a lot of money and you can use it for a lot of different things. Um, and as it's composting, one of, the, one of the things I like about composting the horse manure is that if you do it properly, which is monitor the um, temperature, the moisture content, which should be about like a wet sponge, but not dripping. And um, you monitor the temperature, um, it'll reduce up to 50%. It'll, it'll just drop, it's amazing to watch it do that. So, um, and then once it's done, it's clean, odor, odorless, so. And it really does help knock down the flies uh, if you compost, because um, especially in the summertime. Now, there's a picture of good compost, and it's a great soil amendment. 
Um, you can, you know, I've used compost and pots, you know, for potting plants and things. It's, it's just a great product if it's done correctly. And I say all the time, horse manure, if it's properly composted, when you look at the uh, NPK profile, the nutritional profile, um, it is the best of any manures out there. Chicken manure, dairy manure, I don't care what you, pig manure, especially pig, but it is the best uh, soil amendment and best soil product you're going to buy. So uh, compo if you've got horse manure, compost it, you'll save yourself a lot of money and you'll be very pleased with it. So now quickly, we want to talk about um, pasture management and grass. So why, why do we want to care about grass? Well, a couple of main things is, the first thing I like to talk about is we, we worry about mud. Well, mud comes from excess water and excess water happens because there's nothing there to take it away. The, the soil can only absorb so much and it can only drain so much through it. Most of the soils around here, like the tocal soils, the older wood soils, um, they have a hard pan. And as we get into this time of year, those of you with those kind of soils are probably seeing a lot of ponding around because this, the water cannot drain through that hard pan fast enough. But what helps is grass. Grass, like trees, like any plant, one of its processes that it does is it will take up water through the roots and, and respire it into the air through the blades of grass. So if you have a good grass uh, base, you will have less water just by that effect, uh, less excess water. So we, that's a one great reason to grow good grass and to protect the soil and that grass from turning into mud by turning your horses out at the wrong time of year. The other thing that grass is good for is it's, it helps you on your wallet. Because if you have it, it, when it comes to a horse, when it comes to the horse's nutrition, it is really a math game. So I've got one horse and I know that he eats about 20 pounds of hay a day, okay? So that's about a third of a 60 pound bale, right? So, I know that he's gonna go through a bale every three days. So I start doing that math and how much is in that bale as far as grass goes. Now, if I don't have a good pasture for him to graze on in the spring and summer, then he's gonna eat more of my hay or I'm gonna to have to pay for more hay to feed him, right? But if I have good pasture grass, I can feed him, you know, um, I can feed him about 10 pounds in the morning for breakfast or through the night, put him out on pasture, bring him back and feed him five. It just depends, it's, like, it's a real math game and it, it really depends on each horse, you know, so, but if you have good pasture, you will spend less oh, in total over a year in what you buy for hay. So uh, really, really good reason <laughs> to have good um, pasture grass. And also, if you have good grass and good pasture, you don't have a lot of weeds because those weeds can be toxic uh, to the horses. So uh, something really to think about. Um, also, uh, good pasture will recycle the manure. So all that compost that you've created, you can put out on that pasture and it will benefit greatly. And it, it'll be just like a symbiotic system between, you know, all the operations on your farm. Um, and it'll keep, the grass will keep the soil in place. It filters out that bacteria. And your neighbors love looking at a beautiful pasture. I, I used to have a friend, uh, he's moved since, uh, he, he's a veterinarian. He moved up here from Kansas and he's moved down south, but um, uh, south of here now near Olympia or so. But um, he used to have a beautiful pasture and his neighbor, was great. He asked his neighbor if his horses could go over and go, oh yeah, I love looking at your place. I mean, there's good reasons why you want a good pasture. Now, there, now if you don't manage your pasture, you're going to get low to non-existent yields. Weeds will invade. 
get, it'll become compacted, runoff of manure, all the bad stuff that worst case scenario will happen. Um, quickly about the, there's cool season grasses, warm season grasses. If you're looking at overseeding or if you're looking at redoing your pasture, um, I always recommend getting a pasture mix. Don't go with a one brand of grass. I mean, you can go get all orchard grass. You can do that. Um, but horses are like us. They like variety. And the other thing is, is that you, you also want grass growing as much as possible all through the seasons. Okay, so as the cool season grass starts to drop off, the warm season grass will pick up and it'll continue to add nutrients and take up water and everything else in your pasture. So, and um, as long as they're vegetative, the horse will get the best nutrients from it, so. And if you let the horses graze too much, uh, if you continuous graze, then the grass will be short, but look at what happens to the roots. The shorter the grass, the shorter the roots. And this is why you don't ever wanna graze below three inches. If you go below three inches, those blades of grass lose their photosynthetic effect and they can't send energy down to the root system and they'll really begin to die off. So the, if you let the uh, uh, grass grow, if you make your grazing time short, you'll get the best root system and it'll be best for the grass and you'll have a much better quality grass. Uh, soil fertility, of course, is a very important one. Um, you wanna test your soil for nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And the biggest one here is pH. Uh, so I'll touch real quickly on that. pH um, is percent hydrogen. Um, in the soil, it tends to be around here about 5.6 to 5.7, depending on your soil type. What we want for good grass is 6.5 to 7. And so the way we're gonna get that up is to add lime. Um, and lime comes in a couple of forms. Uh, there's ag lime, which is just ground up limestone. And then there's dolomite lime. So if your uh, soil is low in magnesium, uh, dolomite lime includes magnesium. So uh, you can put that on there and help that out as well. Uh, calcium and magnesium are also important. There's a ratio to them, uh, but you want uh, good levels of those. And tell the lab that you send the soil test to what you want. I expect um, X amount of grass, you know, and they'll give you recommendations for liming and fertilizing based on that. So again, I talked real quickly about uh, the agricultural versus dolomite lime. Uh, fall is the best time to apply the lime, although you can apply it any time of year when the pasture is safe to get out into. If you start leaving footprints, uh, or if you're leaving footprints, don't take the tractor out there to lime, okay? <laughs> Wait until it's safe. But I would do it in the fall. That way, the fall the fall rains and the winter rains will break it up because lime is pretty dense and it it you need to break it up. Um, and I use pelleted lime because the powder tends to drift a whole lot in the wind. Uh, you lose a lot more, uh, and pellet is just easier to work with, especially when it comes to the cedars that you might use at the spreaders. Uh, rotational grazing. Uh, here's a picture of a barn with the different pastures we can go into every day. Um, so you might, of course, you're going to have different areas. Um, you might break them up in different ways, but kind of look at your place and see how you could rotate from pasture to pasture, even if it's just two back and forth, back and forth. Um, any sort of rest time you can give those pastures is beneficial to let them recover. Uh, again, that rest period allows that plant to regrow. Um, you can rotate. Uh, between paddocks every three to six days sometimes. Um, even if you have to bring them into the barn and keep them stalled for a couple of days before you turn them back out, letting that grass rest and regrow and, and do what it needs to do is the most important. So if the horse has to spend another day in the stall, it's you know not desirable, but it's what you gotta do, so. And of course, we can help out with stocking rates. Um, if you've got 50 horses on two acres, hmm, you might have a problem. Um, but if you've got, you know, a couple of horses and you're sitting on 50 acres and you say, can I add one more? Well, probably, uh, but we can help you with that as well. And this is rotational grazing. I like this picture to the cattle dog. Uh, now, 
the cattle dog is not used for rotational grazing, although <laughs> he could probably move a few horses pretty well. Um, mowing after grazing is important um, because when you pull the horses off, uh, you want to mow that grass to three inches, everything to be three inches. If you don't even it off, then what happens is because the horses won't eat some grasses and they won't eat some of the weeds, they'll be taller. They'll actually be taking up more nutrients and the they'll outcompete the grass. So you want to make sure you make everything even and give the grass the best chance it can, it can get. Again, when the grass is grazed down to three inches, um, you need to pull them off when it's saturated or wet. Um, if you let them go below three inches, that's where a lot of the parasites live. So you need to be careful of that and don't graze on saturated pastures. Uh, again, avoid over and under grazing, the three inch rule. Uh, mow pastures before reaching 12 inches. So if you're not going to graze the pasture, you don't want to let it get too far because if it begins to seed out or get above about 12 inches for most grass, it'll stop, it, it'll, it'll get out of that vegetative state. And so that means that the horses will graze on it and then it, it won't regrow. It'll just be done. So you need to make sure you keep it in that vegetative state and mow it before it gets too high if you're not going to graze it. Um, fences and stream crossings, of course, we want to make sure that the fences uh, are around the wetlands and the streams to keep them out. Uh, there's things like nose pumps. Uh, they don't work well for horses, but they do for cattle. But there are other off-stream uh, watering systems that we could use. Um, there's a solar panel with a pump. Um, and bridges across, uh, we've designed a few bridges for folks. Um, there's a really good one on Woods Creek that we did uh, to keep the horses and livestock out of the stream and also to help the salmon. Uh, that, this one I think used to have a culvert and uh, of course it was restricting the, the fish flows and stuff for a lot of different reasons. And, but uh, the new, new theories and, and new uh, uh, designs are all bridges. And native plants around the waterways you've got uh, will help stabilize them and help filter out a lot of the nutrients from the horses. So quick review, um, you wanna create a sacrifice area with good footing and drainage, test that soil and lime it so that you can get good grass, compost the manure and apply it to the pasture, give grass a winter and summer vacation. Okay, so because they're gonna go dormant in the summer too and in the winter time, they're gonna to be too wet. Rotate grazing, mow after grazing to control the weeds and to give the grass the best chance to regrow. Keep grass at least three to four inches tall and fence livestock out of the streams and take special care of grass in the fall. And that means keeping the uh, horses off of it and making sure it has what it needs for the next coming year. So um, again, I thank everybody for uh, coming tonight. Um, I have always felt that it's our responsibility as horse owners um, to um, do what's right and what's best. And not only will that help show our government officials who are worried that our animals are putting manure into the stream, they'll be able to trust us more with that and we won't be regulated so much um, like dairies and whatever, a lot of other agricultural uh, businesses are, but also it's it's for the non-horse owners that when they drop by our place, they go, that's a nice place. Wow, look how he's doing that. I wonder how he does it. You know, you want them to have a good positive aspect of it, not um, looking down on you because your manure pile stinks or you got flies coming over and, you know, so we need to be good stewards of what we have and good ambassadors. Um, we have a sign program. So if you have a horse property down in the North Creek area and um, you've done a lot of these practices, have me out. Um, we've got the sign you can put on your uh, gate and let people know, hey, this is what I'm doing. It's part of that ambassador thing, right? And that's all I have. Um, again, uh, my name is Michael Hip. I'm a farm planner with the Snohomish Conservation District. And 
that's me up in Oklahoma. <laughs> we just got run, done uh, working some cattle and uh, that's my new buddy there, the little dog. So um, if you have any questions, there's my number, my email, uh, please contact me anytime. Thanks. We currently don't have any questions for you, Michael, but I wanna give folks a minute to um, process because you gave so much good information and um, I'm sure people are creating lists right now as we speak. <laughs> But we'll just give a couple minutes uh, for folks have any questions and always just appreciate your time and all of the information you have for folks um, who either have had horses for a while and have been struggling with really implementing some of these practices or are just newer to um, horse keeping so maybe need some of this guidance. Um, but folks have just been saying thank you. Really appreciate your time. And I'm just gonna check on Facebook to see if we have any questions. Um, looks like you just got a few hellos from some of your fans, Michael. Uh, one question we did have come in is, um, how hard is it to compost and what are some of the best steps? That's a really good question. Um, and the difficulty of composting depends on a lot of factors, but the most common ones that I run into are, um, it's, it's especially hard in the winter time, especially hard because the three most important things when it comes to composting are temperature, uh, water, uh, moisture in the, in the compost system and air. Okay. Now, the reason those things are important is because what we're dealing with in the compost process is we are trying to help living organisms in the compost and in, in the manure pile to, they're basically eating the manure and breaking it down. And the heat from a compost pile, if you ever go out there and pull a tarp off of one and it's really hot, that heat is coming from the metabolism of those little microbes, okay? So what we're trying to do is protect those guys. It's really easy in the summertime to have a pile and have the tarp on it. Um, and, you know, especially if you turn the dark side of the tarp up so the sun can warm that, because the warmer they get, the faster they'll go and the more efficient they are. And the moisture is, it's got to be like a, a wet sponge, but doesn't drip. And I always monitor with a, um, uh, a compost thermometer. So you put it in there and you can monitor the temperature, keep it above 130 degrees. And when it starts to drop, then you need to ask, is it moist enough? Maybe, you know, if you add some water and it still doesn't work, you know, it might be need to be turned at that point. So, and then, you know, it stopped when it's, there's nothing you can do to raise the temperature. The microbes are done. They're starting to die off. Plus it doesn't smell like manure anymore. It smells like soil. So, um, but the most important, the hardest thing I think is keeping that going, especially in the winter time when your ambient temperature like tonight is gonna be down in the twenties. There's no way you can do that unless your manure pile is inside somewhere and you got heaters on it, which that'd be pretty extreme. Um, but just by keeping a tarp on it, keeping it protected, um, you can do a lot. It might slow down or even stop, but then it'll pick up when uh, the weather gets warmer. But Perfect. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's some of those tricky things where you have to have that really trifecta of mm -hmm. those like key, you know, rotating with that air. And then, yeah, if it's too dry, need some water. But they need water and air just like we do. That's what I always think when my compost is just out there stagnant, <laughs> but food scraps feel different. And, you know, of course the rodents do some turning for me. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, just folks are just really appreciating all the information and um, offer their thanks. And if no one has any more questions for either Michael or Christy, 
I think we are going to end it. So appreciate both of your times tonight and uh, appreciate folks who um, are watching and really just joining in with us tonight. We appreciate your, your participation and you know we all need to hear this information as well. So it's a great resource. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Christy. Thanks, all right. Everyone have a good night. You good night. too. Bye. Bye.